if you're the only officer in the community, then that's it. You're working 24-7. At the end of the day, I'm here to protect my people and serve my people, and I'll do it my best with what I have. The catchment area is actually this two-thirds the size of uh, Ontario. But when you look at that, that, that vast region that we policed, it's, uh, it's huge. And uh, that's why we have to you know, lease a plane. And we cover from the Manitoba border right over the Quebec border and as far north as the you know, James and Hudson Bays. So it's a very, very large area to, to police. And, and it comes with numerous challenges. A NAPS officer, I think in my mind, does a lot more than say a municipal police officer because they're a first responder, they're the police officer, they're the fireman, they're the counselor, they're the whatever you need them to be for that day. You were having different hats and that's the, the reality of our police officers. And of course that's going to affect the individual. You get to see a person after a while, constantly doing that over and over again. You know, I've, I've worked uh, 36, 40 hours straight and without any sleep, without any partners. And that's doing all the paperwork, that's guarding, and that's um, transporting the prisoner to the airport for, for pickup. That's 40 hours. And you want to get home and get some sleep, you know, like you're, you're realizing that you're overtired. And uh, so you wear what you solve like that, working alone. Right now, I'm the only officer in the community. Like I'm, I'm from here. I know everybody. Everybody knows me. I work 16 days off or 12. That's the same thing with my partners. But they get to leave. I get to stay here on my days off. Even when my partners are working, people still call my house because everybody knows my home number. Beginning of my career, like first 10 years, it was hard. It was hard for me. Like I've arrested my sisters, my brothers, my uncles. Lost my father to drowning. I had to take that car. I had to go find him and I found him a day later. I lost my sister to a suicide. Same thing, I took that car. Numerous nephews, nieces, suicide. So I had no choice. I had to take two calls. And that was that. I couldn't couldn't function anymore, couldn't do nothing. Next day, boss came to visit me from Thunder Bay, saw me right away, said, all right, that's it, you're, you're done. So after that, I was off for two years. A lot of the officers are burnt out, tired, um, you know, uh, and, and suffer from compassion fatigue even. But as soon as that call comes in, and if you're already tired, right away, the care and the attention that I think a victim deserves, say if it's her first time going through something like this, the level drops because uh, number one, the officer's tired. They're not able to give that, you know, extra care. And, and as NAPS officers, I think we all kind of push through that. I've had bad experiences with police officers where they treated me bad. And I knew that I never wanted to be a police officer like that. But I'm proud to be a First Nations police officer and always have been. But I've also experienced struggles within the First Nations Police Service. But at the end of the day, I always was proud to put on my uniform and do my job. Quite often, chiefs and counselors will tag along with the officers because there's only one officer and it's something that somebody's going to get hurt if we don't have, uh, you know, backup type thing. And where else in this world does a mayor uh, or a town councillor have to go out and help the police to arrest somebody and wrestle them down in the mud? It, this just doesn't happen. So why does it have to happen here? Why is it happening here still? I'm kind of caught. Sometimes I want the officer to take the time off and, you know, recharge and regroup at the same time. I have to keep that officer because I want to provide a service to the community that we need to protect. So you're constantly trying to make those decisions, not only for your officer, but for the community you serve, because they all equally need the help in some way. In the simplest form, if you need a police officer, you should be able to pick up the phone and get one. It's very difficult. 
And it's also very difficult to have to see people, that, uh, very good people, not have safety. I can't confidently say with the numbers that we've been working with that our communities are safe. And that's the job that I swore to do. You don't have enough people, you're killing the ones you got left, right? Because you're, you're overworking them. I think it's just a basic human right, really, to, to, to feel safe and to have protection. And it's a, it's a human right that should be available to everybody. It's not just for the privileged, you know, it's, it's, it's a right that whether you're living in Ottawa or whether you're living in Kasachewan or Fort Severn, that you should have that right to safety in your own home, in your own community. What I see is that when people know, they care. You know, when people are educated, they care about what happens in the North. But our country isn't very educated about what's happening, and that's a big, huge problem.